Dr. Arthur Whaley uh, is um, our keynote speaker today, that he's going to talk to us today about Afrocentric violence prevention for urban black youth, a 20-year academic community partnership. I'll just say that Dr. Arthur Whaley is one of the few people who deemed it necessary to go beyond his PhD and get his doctorate in public health. So that says a little bit something about him in terms of his brilliance. And he is a research evaluation consultant. He's gonna talk about some of his research. So without further delay, without further, what is it, delay? Do you know, let, let me tell you a joke. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I will attribute this to Kwame, who's actually watching, who educated me. Do you know that, well, this was my analysis of what he taught me, but it's possible that errors in using the English language and even the use of eubonics helps to keep your mind just a little bit free from the social conditioning and brainwashing. So in that tradition, Dr. Whaley, be next. And this really is gonna be a, a talk just about my experience working with uh, Elder John McQueen. Um, next slide, please. So here's an overview of what I'm gonna attempt to talk about. And again, I'm gonna read everything pretty much. My background will be talked a little bit about my personal and professional background that led me into this journey. Uh, interpersonal violence and black youth, talk about the research related to that. Gave you some uh, discussion of the initiation of the academic community partnership and development of the research infrastructure which I created as a part of, of our partnership. Then present some of the published work that we've done and uh, some summary conclusion. Now one of the things I should say, sort of uh, dovetailing off of Dr. Wallace's talk, she basically said that she was able to sponsor 120 doctor students uh, without support, which is great. And that is very much in line with the African tradition of making a way out of no way. And uh, I can say the same thing about our partnership with me and John McQueen. We have done the work that we are gonna present without any funding whatsoever. Now that doesn't mean we don't want funding. We do want funding. We want money, we need money. So if you have any ideas, we welcome them. But the point is that we didn't, we didn't allow the lack of funding to stop us from doing the kind of work that we've done. <clears throat> so let me tell you a little bit about this partnership. I am an African American that grew up in New York by way of South Carolina. Uh, Elder John is from Guyana. I am Guyana Grenada, I wanna make that right. Grenada, I'm sorry, Grenada. And I am a clinical psychologist and slash psychiatric epidemiologist. Elder John is a social worker. But those differences are superficial, basically, because we are both black men that understands, because of our love of community, that we need to provide support, guidance, and whatever we can provide to the young people to make a better life for our community as well as for them personally. So I wanted to just say that as a way of giving thanks for the opportunity. And as you'll see as the work progresses, it definitely is an opportunity to work with uh, LJ. And there's Elder Lorraine, Lord Kirk. She'll, you'll see her name up here as well. She is his right-hand person, and she's always the person I talk to when we need to get things done. <laughs> Next slide, please. So my personal journey with it, I grew up in Harlem. And uh, I moved from South Carolina when I was uh, in the beginning of my teenage years. So I went to public school, then got a scholarship to private school, and that private school scholarship paved the way for educational privilege for me. So that's why I'm here now. I have colleagues and friends who are dead, who are in jail. Um, some of them still is alive and still and working, trying to survive. And they're still my closest friends. But my point is that I appreciate the fact that privilege is structured. You know, people tell me, oh, you're so smart, that's why you got out. Well, there were a lot of people that were just as smart as me that didn't get out. So, but because I was lucky to get the opportunity, the path was clear for me. And so I just want to point that, make that point very clear to folks. 
The other thing I wanted to talk about very briefly, and I'm not going to go into details, is violence has been a very much big part of my life in terms of losing family members um, and knowing people in the community. I personally know several young men who didn't live past the age of 21 because of gun violence. And I know a lot more that didn't make it past the age of 40. And these are people I went to school with, who I partied with, sometimes had fights with, but a lot of them are not here anymore. And I think that that's part of what motivated me to get involved um, in violence research. But there was a transformational experience for me in 1990. I was um, a psychologist at the Alice Substance Abuse Program at North General Hospital in Harlem. And I had a 19-year-old patient who came into me for a session and had signed and finally figured out what he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to go into the military. But he had a plan and he had decided that this was his way of changing his life to make a better life. The next week I heard that he was killed. Um, a gunfight, well, not even a gunfight, a kid shot him because he was wittier than that kid. In other words, I don't know how many people know about the dozens, playing the dozens. We used to do that when we were kids. You know, I talk about your mama, you talk about my mama, whoever has the best jokes win. Well, apparently this young man didn't like being the loser, and he went home, got a gun, and shot my patient. And that experience actually is what transformed me in terms of addressing the issue of violence in the black community. Um, you know, I have addressed a number of issues, and I tend to try to address issues in my professional career that's relevant to my experiences in the black community. <laughs> in 1988, I worked at an agency called the Urban Family Services Center. Let me just say this also uh, as a side note. I was, in 87, I was an uh, assistant professor um, in the doctoral program at Rutgers University. But one of my um, commitments is that I always had a part-time job working in the community. That was just something that I felt like I needed to do for a couple of reasons. One, it allowed me to, con to stay grounded in my clinical work and practice, but it also allowed me to keep in touch with what was going on in the community since I professed to be someone who was interested in working and changing the community. So Urban Family Services Center <coughs> in 1988 was the job that I had. One of the things I remember when I interviewed, uh, one of the caseworkers looked at my CV and she said to me, why do you want to work with us? You know, they were like suspicious, like, you got all this, why do you want to work with us? And I actually had a, a, a friend of the family who told me the same thing. Like, why don't you work downtown at, you know, Cornell Wild, one of those fancy hospitals? You know, you got all those degrees and all this stuff. And I said to her, as well as to the people who uh, questioned me, don't uh, our people need to, should get the best service? Shouldn't we get the best qualified people? And so that's, that was probably one of the reasons why I, that's one of the reasons I feel like I have been committed because people have eventually realized that it's not just a game or it's just not just a, you know, something to do, but it's something that I really feel very passionate about. So I was working at Urban Family Services Center and uh, one of my missions, and this was a personal mission, because one of the things that I want to do in my professional career is bring research to the community, bring what I've learned in the academy and make it relevant to the community. So one of the things that I, I was beginning to do at Urban Family Services. And the other thing is I, I'm kind of a troublemaker wherever I go. So anyway, at Urban Family Services Center, I was going to develop a system where the caseworkers could do an intake assessment, and the assessment could automatically translate into goals so they can do their UCRs, their 90-day, you know, 180-day UCRs. And then they could use that information to track the progress of their patients. So that's what I was working on. In addition to that, I conducted the assessments and I use culturally relevant assessment materials. So I was uh, trying to put that together, um, and then we had a big blowout because I felt like the, uh, the director at that time was abusive to people, and I just can't stand, I mean, I just don't mind my business. That's basically what it comes to. And if I see something wrong, I have to say something, and then it, gets, you know, it becomes a problem. But I met uh, a social worker by the name of Thelma Spark who uh, is, is, I think she's Trinidadian, uh, by, uh, Jamaican, okay. Well anyway, she was, I was working with a Caribbean family and I wasn't getting anywhere. So she, I transferred the case over to her and then she was able, a couple, 
pretty much a newlywed couple. And so she was able to handle the case. And one of the things, well, two things it taught me. One of the things that it taught me is, and which is something you'll see in the literature, but you don't really start to see it in real life often enough, the difference between ethnicity and culture and race. I mean, just because I was black and the couple was black didn't mean that I knew what they needed culturally or ethnically. Because when I transferred the case over to her, and I, when I listened to some of the things she said, I would have never come up with some of those things. So it's important to understand the difference between race slash ethnicity and culture. Those things are related, but they're not the same. Anyway, in 1999, this was after I had left the Urban Family Services Center. And uh, you can see I jumped through. I did a lot of things in between 88 and 99. I'm only going to try to focus on the things that are relevant to, to, to this talk. Um, one of the things I did in that time frame was I did a postdoc at the Maryland School of Public Health, and then I got into, rolled into a doctoral program in, in epidemiology. But in 99, I was a research scientist at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. And I got a call from Ms. Mark. <laughs> 11 years, never heard from her. You know, she just called me out of the blue. And then she said to me, she says, um, I remember you were interested in research. You were trying to do some research at Urban Family Services Center with us. I have a colleague who, you know, we're trying to get funding, and I told him that you might be a person to be able to, to help him. And so she introduced me to uh, John McQueen. You know, I went to visit. You know, I was kind of skeptical. I've been in community mental health for a while in New York City, in addition to being uh, an academic. And my experiences in general is that most agencies don't really serve the needs of the community. In fact, most of the people who work in the agency, primarily in terms of administration, are self-serving. So when I met John, you can, I had a little bit of skepticism. So I went, met, we talked. He told me about his program. There were a couple of things that struck me about uh, Elder John. One was they were doing the services and none of the people who were doing the services were getting salaries. So that was one thing. Two, he was committed to an Afrocentric perspective and wanted to create a research evaluation of his program to make sure he was doing the right thing. So those two things immediately impressed me with him. And I decided at that point that, you know, he's somebody that I would like to work with. You know, because like I said, I've worked with and around several people in community mental health in New York City, in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, in Harlem. And so this is the first time I met somebody who had that level of integrity and commitment to service. So, so we developed a partnership at that point. Next slide, please. This, you'll see the article that I wrote about violence. Let me just say violence. Prevention is incidental to the partnership. It was just because of something that I had some track record. One of the things that we do as academics, or we train to do, is that we're supposed to write grants about stuff that we know about, stuff that we have, we can convince the funder that we have the ability and knowledge and experience to create and be successful. So violence prevention was on the horizon at the time that I had met John, so I said, well, let's do it. But we could have easily done it with academic underachievement. We could have done it with pregnancy prevention. We could have done it with uh, sexual transmitted, sexual transmitted disease prevention, AIDS prevention. So we could have done it with anything because fundamentally the program is designed to change youth's sense of identity and self and ability to navigate this social system. So this is how I conceptualize the problem as I see it. Um, and when I wrote the article, it was one of the few, if not the only one at that time, according to somebody who I met later, who was doing her dissertation in this area, saying this was one, the, one of the few, if not only articles that she found that talked about the need for a culturally relevant approach to violence prevention. Now, I don't know how true that is, but that was what I was told. But basically, and within that article, and within my purview, and what I think about is, and some of the same things Dr. Watson was, stereotypes are very powerful influence 
in our society. Negative stereotypes in particular about uh, black males. In fact, I'm doing a paper now on the intersection between race and gender in African-American women. And one of the things that the literature shows is that stereotypes of gender. In other words, when you think black, if you ask a person to imagine a black person, they're automatically gonna think about a black male. In fact, there's actually some research also, some social cognitive research that suggests when you have people looking at uh, videos of black males, black females, white males, white females, and you ask them to identify statements, who made what, said what, it's harder for them to process what black women say. And so they argue that that's a part of the invisibility. And then it's also a part of that, um, from the feminist <coughs> and womanist perspective, the whole intersectional idea, the idea of intersectionality, uh, which was started by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, you know, as she saw that discrimination suits were problematic for black women because they didn't neatly just fit into the race discrimination category or the gender discrimination category. Race discrimination is for black men, gender discrimination is for white women. And so black women were having difficult times with these cases. So she uh, introduced the concept of intersectionality. So that's an aside. But my point is that uh, negative stereotypes of black males, and I cite a number of uh, articles, including some of my own work, that shows that you're more likely to be hospitalized for the same level of symptomology as a white person, but you're more likely to be hospitalized. And you can go on more drugs, you know, heavier doses of drugs, more restraints, all these kinds of things. <clears throat> and uh, within the school and, and the criminal justice system, I read, um, what's, what's her name, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow? It's a great book. I mean, it's come sometimes a little bit cumbersome in terms of the details, but it really gives one a good appreciation for how the legal system and the, histo the historic connection between current legal practices and slavery and Jim Crow is a continuity of oppression for African-American people. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Morris and Perry and uh, Madison and Aver and some other people have looked at African-American students. Uh, Morrison Perry's study in social problems is a, uh, a national study. Madison, Madison and Aver looked at an individual school. But they found essentially the same thing, that uh, black students are overrepresented in suspensions and expulsions, um, even for the same offenses that are committed by white students. Triplet et al., an interesting article, the Journal of Negro Education is an interesting article, because one of the things they talk about in that article is the ideology or the origination of zero tolerance policies is because of rampage shootings primarily in white suburban um, school, oh, excuse me, schools, middle class white males shooting up schools. That's where those policies emanated from as a prevention technique to prevent. The idea is that if you address the small things, it won't get to the point of being a shooting. However, those policies are disproportionately implemented in schools that serve African American and Latino kids, even though they don't engage in that kind of behavior. One of the things that I wanted to say, and I didn't put the slide up, I just wrote an article um, in the Journal of Community and Applied Social Psychology uh, and it's titled something like the massacre mentality and school and rampage school shootings separating culture from psychopathology because the narrative is that the, all these people are mentally ill. But I argue in that article that it's a part of historic U.S. Western and cultural values. So it's a cultural phenomenon. It's not an issue of psychopathology. Some of them are mentally ill but the majority of them are not. And if you look at work by people like Richard Nisbet, who's a social psychologist at the University of Michigan, who's been studying this in white males since the 90s, he demonstrates quite clearly that there's what they call a culture of honor, which comes out. If you look at Western movies, you see it. You know, Somebody done shamed my daughter, so I got to go and have a gunfight. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's that kind of mentality, but it's very much real and still contemporary. And that's part of what's driving some of these rampage shootings. That's the argument I make. The other argument I make in that article is that rampage shootings or the mask mentality does not apply to African-American kids. 
you know. African American kids hit bystanders because they just don't know how to shoot, use guns. A lot of these kids who are shooting uh, up schools in, in middle class white suburbs, they go hunting. They go to gun ranges. So they are very effective with the weapons. Whereas most kids get their guns illegally in the African American community, uh, the guns that are involved in these shootings tend to be legally bought. So the point that I want to make is that although zero tolerance policies are supposed to address the issue of rampage shootings, African American and Latino youth bear the brunt, according to Triplett et al., and their article according to Journal of Negro Education, of those kinds of policies. And even when you look at the work of some other people, it clearly shows that they're disproportionately practiced on kids of color for the same kinds of infractions. There's an article that I left out, which I think is also very important, um, by uh, Cup Chicken Catlaw. This was published in Social, no, I'm sorry, Youth and Society, I believe. But basically what they did was they looked at a cohort of people uh, in terms of their voting habits and their civic participation. And what they found was when they looked at the history of those kids in terms of their education, the ones, particularly Latino and African American kids who don't participate, were more likely to have been expelled or suspended in uh, high school. So that these actions have long-term consequences for, for our youth. So given that context, how do we understand violence? I didn't define it. I think Dr. Wallace did a great job, so I don't need to define it. So I'll just go with her definition, because I think it's, it's, it's perfect. But these are the factors that I think come together to create violence among African-American youth. Internalized racism, what does that mean? You have the same stereotypes and attitudes and, and views of black people that white society has. You have a devaluation of black life, you know? And in fact, it's supported by the system because when a young man is killed by another black young man, the police effort and resources are minimal to try to find out. We don't, still don't know who killed Biggie and Tupac. No, and they're celebrities. So how is that possible? That's because the system gives almost a pass in a subtle way to black on black murder and massacre. So we see and think the way that white society thinks about us and therefore it doesn't mean anything. Those of us who, not everybody feels this way, everybody thinks this way. In fact, this is why we do our program to try to challenge that. But those who think this way are more likely to kill their fellow peers. Okay. And Barbara talked about a maladaptive coping with depression, uh, oppression. Um, one, of the, my, one of my favorite quotes, and I'll paraphrase it because I don't remember it exactly, from um, um, Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, where he basically says, you know, the, um, the colonized people suffer humility all day, humiliation all day long till it builds up frustration in them and that it doesn't take but a slight word for them to harm or hurt another colonial oppressed people. In other words, displaced aggression. You feel the weight of the oppression, but you're not lashing back because you fear the repercussions, so you take it out on your peers or sometimes your family. All of these things have been, limit, have been associated with domestic violence, youth violence, have been associated with displaced aggression, sometimes associated with, with, with oppression. Okay, so that's the maladaptive coping. Social engineering, what do I mean by that? Society is designed in such a way that you have limited opportunities you know, you're told that you can be anything you want to be in America. You know, just work hard. You know, I know people who've been working hard for 50 years and they're still living in the same place in the same. There is a system. We also learned about the system through Felicity Huffman. I don't remember who the person is. Some uh, stars paying to get their kids into the, to school. That's part of the social engineering. So, the, so if you got money, you can make deals, you know. 
So how is that pulling yourself up by your bootstrap? How is that, you know, a fair playing field? So social engineering limits your opportunity, tells you you can be whatever you want to be, shows you the extravagant lifestyle, living large lifestyle, but you have not the resources or the opportunities to make it happen. And in fact, you are fulfilling a stereotype that's been designed to create for you, which is that you're lazy, you don't try hard enough, you know, you just don't have the drive, or you don't have what it takes mentally or psychologically. You're just not fit. So if you buy that, then you're buying into a system that sets it up where you have aspirations that are crushed before you even get out of school because they're telling you you can't do it. And the proof is the social engineering. We talked about, Dr. Wallace talked about the Drug, Drug Abuse Act and those, those kinds of challenges that come along with those. One of the things that I think is a very good example of social engineering is the Iran-Contra scandal. Anybody know about that? You know? CIA was bringing drugs into the community. CIA was supporting the drug dealers to make the money, to make the exchange for weapons in terms of the, the, um, the, the Sandinistas and the Contras in South America. So drugs were being socially sanctioned by the government at the same time that laws were now becoming stricter for selling drugs. <laughs> so it's interesting. I mean, Malcolm X was very prophetic. Because one of the things he said, he says, you know, they bring drugs in the community so you can sell them, and then they lock you up for selling them. That's what the Roger Contra uh, and Drug Abuse Act was, was, was about. So all those things come together and create a very volatile situation because turf, ter ter you know, turf wars and all those kinds of things are real, real. People get shot, people get hurt. But it's the manufacturing of a system that was created by blocked opportunities and access to easy money through drugs. Next slide, please. So in, a, in meeting with uh, John McQueen, uh, I'm missing a piece. I don't know if it's in this part. Anyway, um, in meeting with John McQueen, one of the things that, and I'll talk a little bit more detail about, about our meeting, but a couple of things that I have been aware of, have been concerned with. Social science research also perpetuates stereotypes about black people. And some so-called black scholars are part of that. Code of the Streets, Elijah Anderson, black sociologist. Urban underclass, William Julius Wilson, black sociologist. All these ideas, and <laughs> one of your Columbia professors, Jeffrey Fagan, criminologist of Columbia, with Deanna Wilkinson. Uh, the reason I put that in there is because I actually just wrote a paper comparing the code of the streets and the culture of honor, which is a white phenomena, and essentially saying that they, they have um, a lot in common. But those ideas or theories, so like we are sort of functioning in cultural isolation, and it's almost like saying that we're animals because of these dep deprivations. The deprivations are real, but uh, William Julius Wilson actually had a change of heart because he wrote an editorial that I read in the New York Times long ago, where he said that he regretted creating the term underclass because he wrote a book, When Work Disappears, where he came to a revelation that black men want to work, you know, contrary to the un urban underclass myth of, you know, pathological behaviors and laziness. But there are some social scientists who also do good things. Uh, I was trying to remember. Ralph Salmon is the basketball player. Robert Salmon is a black sociologist. <laughs> Sometimes I get them confused. But uh, Robert Sampson at the University of Chicago um, did some work. The publication I'm citing is in science on what's called collective efficacy. And basically is that no matter whether the ethnicity of the community, the income level of the community, if the people worked as a unit, 
looked out for each other, looked out for their neighbors or whatever, they had less violence in the community. So collective efficacy, to me, is a variation on collectivism, which is an Afrocentric value, you know. So I'm not surprised that, that he found that. Uh, Dory Gilbert, <laughs> Gilbert Harvey and Belgrave, two social work scholars and a psychologist, basically saying that we need to have more Afrocentric kinds of um, models. In fact, we should create evidence based on programs in the community and build our evidence from the community, which is, uh, I think, a better approach than imposing things on the community. And Janet Ward, in her article on violence prevention in the Harvard Education Review, makes an appeal for black youth to develop a, what she called a, a morality of caring for each other. If you can see yourself in your peer, you're less likely to harm them. That's also an uh, African value of collecting, seeing each other, and, and it'll prove to be interesting when I talk about my research. We're gonna move quite along now because I'm about 20 minutes, I only got about 20 minutes left. Next slide, please. Oh, that's just me thanking John McQueen because I didn't create this model just to create it. I actually based it on working with John McQueen. So I did the model and I gave a note in the article to say that that's what forced me to use the language of social scientists to explain what he's doing in the community. What he's doing in the community hasn't changed, it's just that the language that I use to hopefully make it more attractive to funders um, is different. Next slide, please. So this is the process. I met with him on a couple occasions. I asked him to give me everything that he had used to develop the program, I reviewed it, I gave him feedback on it. Uh, and then I, con I conducted a review of the literature. That cognitive cultural model is a review article. And these are uh, the areas that I, I focused on, uh, reviewed, read 177 articles, created the model uh, to try to implement it. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> a little bit about the family renaissance. I'm not gonna go into details. Elder McQueen is here, if anybody wanna know more about it. But uh, I'll just point out that uh, the agency went through a shift uh, in 2000, went from a two-year program to a 15-week curriculum, which actually is very consistent with an evidence-based approach, even though he did it for financial reasons. So it was a confluence of, of a perfect storm in a sense. Next slide, please. This is why it's important to do um, initiate community, academic community uh, partnerships. I'll just summarize this slide. I'm not gonna read it, you can read it as I'm talking. But basically, it's a win-win situation. We are supposed to uh, develop science, in my opinion, to serve humanity. That's my belief. That anything that I do should be in the service of humanity as a social scientist. <clears throat> and so these partnerships allow us to actually get our stuff tested in reality, in the real world, you know? Because one of the things that always is a plaguing question uh, in terms of social science research, even in the area of evidence-based practice, in 1995, a task force on evidence-based practices um, for the American Psychological Association talked about the fact that people were criticizing them because they were doing so much screening that they had the perfect subject that the people weren't even part of reality. I mean, people come to uh, psychologists and psychiatrists, they have polysubstance abuse problems in addition to a depression. They may have spousal abuse, they may have a whole lot of stuff going on. So if you're gonna screen for all of that and only deal with people who show a certain level of depression, you're not dealing with reality. The point about academic community partnerships it is, is a less, uh, allows you to test the metal of that, to test whether you make sense. The other thing is it's good for training for students. It gives students exposure to what is out there you know, because in the academy, you get theory, you know, you might get some clinical work in a very controlled way, but these kinds of experiences put you out there with people on the front line, and you can see what they're coping with. <laughs> and in my opinion, that makes me a better researcher, having been a practitioner, so I understood a lot of the issues when I started working with uh, Elder John. Next slide, please. These are just some of the differences between, and basically, uh, com complementary roles is the second principle, which you can see that we bring something different 
as academic research institutions and community folks, we tend to have more resources. <laughs> we tend to have not the best community relations. I actually tried to do a study um, with some funding from the Psychiatry Institute, and I couldn't get people to participate because they didn't like Columbia. I mean, they just, that's what they were basically saying. And there was a young lady who was, I, I hired, she was a, a student in epidemiology, and I hired her to be a course uh, instructor in my course in epidemiology and biostatistics. And she said she went to Abyssinian Church, and they said to her, you, you're like a nice young lady, but I ain't giving you my blood. I, I'm not giving you, you know, I'm not doing all that. You're a nice young lady, but I don't know what y'all gonna do with that stuff. I ain't giving you any, you know, so, so I'm sorry to tell you, but my point is that we need community partners because they have the trust, they have the respect, and if we come to them correctly, those partnerships can be a win-win for both the community and the academic institution. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the evaluation that I did. I created the assessment batteries, I wrote the informed consent. Everything that I created, we had subjected to several IRBs and they've always been approved. So the consent forms, the assent forms for young people, which is basically young people's consent, even though they're not old enough to give consent, so it's called assent. <clears throat> and um, I created the, the uh, assessment battery, and I'll, pull, I'll show you a detailed picture of that in a minute. But uh, I put it into SurveyMonkey myself. I did it. I, told, I wrote it up in there. Uh, I'm proud of it because it took a lot of time. But it worked out well for the students because they can do the assessment online. And there is research that suggests that compute, well, not, we didn't have the fancy CASI com computer assisted self interviewing, which has been shown to show that kids tend to be more honest when, for things like substance abuse, sexual behavior, and all, when you let them do it in front of a computer instead of a person. So I'm assuming that we might have gotten some good results. We did get good results. So after all of that's done, I downloaded it into a SPSS data set. Next slide, please. These are all the measures. We're not going to go through all the details of them. But the measures, let's go to the, I guess, uh, my right, your left. The domains are consistent with the cognitive cultural model of um, African American identity that I created. So you have cultural socialization, cultural self, individual self, social roles, and outcome. Next slide, please. If you want to see that in more details or the articles, I'll give me a request and I can send you the details. <laughs> this was the first. Um, study that we did. And this is based on a principle of starting where the agency is. Start where people are at in terms of research. What I basically did was uh, ask Elder McQueen, we, we did, he and I co-led a focus group with three of the original graduates of the program. And also uh, Elder Lorraine abstracted information from the charts and I did some analysis. Next slide. This is the model, original model that I was operating from. And what you will notice as we go on, the model gets a little bit more, hopefully, sophisticated uh, as we learn. Next slide, please. These are the questions from the um, focus group. I just want to give you an example. Let's look at number six. How did the program affect your feelings about violence in the community? I tried to make them as non valuative or non judgmental as possible. Um, we taped it. I <laughs> transcribed the tape. It was only about, how long did we take? About a half an hour? It was a lot of work just to do a half an hour. In fact, I just talked to a young lady out of doing a mixed methods a dissertation. She's in, in the PhD program in education. I was like, you don't want to do that. I said, I just did a little bit. Uh, so I have a great appreciation. I'm a quantitative researcher, but I have a great appreciation for what uh, qualitative people go through, it's a lot of work. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just direct you to, there's an example above, the first statement is a young man explaining how um, the program gives them in touch with his African heritage. So uh, I won't read the details to you. Again, the article's in the article. But the other thing was from the chart review, you can see a reduction in, um, I'm sorry, an improvement in grade point average from 73, which is like a C minus, on average to 78. And uh, 
a reduction in classroom behaviors. All this information came from um, report cards that were in the charts. From two on average to none, and same thing for aggressive behavior, it went down from three to one. So the program had an impact. Now one of the things that I was concerned about was uh, selection bias or bias abstraction. So I did some analyses to demonstrate that it was very unlikely that there was bias. So it's in the article. Next slide, please. This uh, was a shift from the two-year program to the 15-week program. Next slide, please. I'm going to go through the details of that. And as you see, the model changed. And we did a mediator, mediating academic performance as a mediator um, variable. And the reason I did that is because the literature, a couple of articles, one by Bennett, who's a social work scholar, and some others, suggesting that um, there's a mediation or relationship between these variables, as well as a direct effect. Next slide, please. This graph represents what I consider, uh, it's a novel technique, it's called multidimensional scaling. And what you, what you do basically is you, uh, it's like factor analysis, but it pulls out implicit dimensions, unconscious cognitions, to use Bobby's word, that how people think about themselves. And the three dimensions that came out was pro black identity was number one, racial ambivalence was number two, and black individualism, which is an interesting concept, and we could talk about that uh, hopefully during the questioning, I'm not gonna spend time on it. But as you can see, the program effects <coughs> were, I'm sorry, you gotta look at the, the, uh, the groups. The program effects <coughs> Increase pro um, pro black identity, reduce black individualism, and reduce ambivalence, which is consistent with what you would expect from an Afrocentric intervention. Next slide, please. We did it with girls. One of the things, Elder Lorraine led the group, and essentially the program was essentially the same. With some adaptations, obviously, in terms of issues that girls deal with. So, but. Most of the cultural stuff is pretty much, pretty much the same. Next slide, please. Again, you see the model changing again. Why the model change? Because I added um, the personal self, which is the measure of self-esteem, Rosenberg self-esteem scale, the global self-worth scale. Because in the original model, the assumption was that we would only impact cultural identity. And the idea was that Cultural identity was low, individual identity or individualism was high because we live in an individual society. Research suggested that for girls, the intervention goes through self-esteem instead of cultural identity, which is different from boys. So we talked about the need to be sensitive to, to gender. But again, this is um, science. You know, we didn't make any assumptions. We just tested it, and that's how we got. The slide, the slide go another MDS multidimensional scaling analysis, but in this case, it was higher after the intervention for girls. Racial ambivalence, uh, a negative, what's called a negative black identity. So for girls, for some reason, the intervention enhanced, in a negative way, sensitivity to, to race and culture identity. Um, and we talked a little bit about it. We were gonna do some other uh, things with the data, but one of the things that came up when I met with uh, Elder John and Lorraine about it, we talked about it, it was that there was a strong religious aspect of the girls' identity for a lot of the girls, and we were wondering whether that might have something to do with it. There is research that shows that religious identity among African Americans um, is associated with lower levels of cultural identity, cultural activism, and racial resistance. There's research that suggests that. So we don't know, but that was one of the things we were thinking about, and maybe when we do, the grant and get some money, we can test that. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay, next. This is imported, so I got a little fancy. This is hot off the press. We just published this this year. We did it for the first time in school. All the other programs were done at Family Renaissance, the agency. Next. This is just the mean scores. What I did 
was instead of using a different score, I used Cohen's D. Next, Cohen's D, for those of you who are taking stats or will take stats, is just comparing the mean difference dividing by the pool standard deviation, which is a measure of effect size, which is less biased um, for type two errors, which means if the, if the D is large, that means the effect is real. Okay, and I can, you can't hardly see, I'm sorry about that, but uh, all the Ds, <coughs> there are a few. Social acceptance by peers went up. Uh, racial identity, as measured by the multi-dimensional uh, multi inventory of black identity, went up. And I think one of the socialization measures went up. Uh, academic competence also went up after, after the intervention. Next slide. Oh, I skipped something. That's fine. Okay, so um, my conclusions. Academic community partnerships are good. They are mutually beneficial. And uh, we should always try to engage in them. And academic institutions need to recognize that they will benefit as much as community agency because now you have science and practice. You will challenge and address issues of external validity. I mean, experiments and evidence-based research is good internally valid. You know, you know you're doing what you're doing, but will it apply to the real world when you get out there? These kind of partnerships will help you do that. Thank you. <laughs>